You are very welcome to this introduction to the second epistle of St. John at the Powellhurst Men's Morning Bible Study. You are welcome to join us Thursday mornings at 7.30 a.m. A snack will be served, but bring your own coffee or other hot beverage. To get started, let's read through this short book. It takes less than two minutes. The second letter of John, the elder, to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not I alone, but also all those who know the truth, because of the truth that resides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I was very glad because I found some of your children walking in the truth, just as the Father commanded us. And now I ask you, lady, not as if I were writing a new commandment to you, but one that we have had from the beginning, that we should love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to His commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess Jesus Christ coming in the flesh. This person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves that you do not lose what we have worked for, but receive a full reward. Everyone who goes too far and does not remain in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who remains in the teaching, this person has both the Father and the Son, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house, and do not speak a greeting to him, because the one who speaks a greeting to him shares in his evil deeds. Although I have many things to write to you, I do not want to do so by means of paper and ink, but I hope to be with you and to speak face to face, so that your joy may be complete. The children of your elect sister greet you. That was from the 2012 Lechem English Bible. As all the other New Testament books, Second John was written in Greek sometime during the first century. Jesus had forewarned his followers, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. John's three epistles, or letters, deal with three kinds of wolves. First John dealt with urban philosophers, Second John with itinerant anti-Christian missionaries, and Third John will deal with arrogant church leaders who oppose Christian missionaries. Now, John was one of Jesus' twelve appointed apostles, an eyewitness to Jesus' baptism, to his miracles, to his transfiguration, to his teaching, and to his resurrection. John had earlier written the Gospel of John, demonstrating that Jesus was both God in human flesh and the awaited Messiah. John later dwelt at the city of Ephesus, where he served as church elder amongst many churches. These probably included city churches at the seven locations that he named later in the book of Revelation, as well as daughter churches in surrounding towns and innumerable house churches meeting in homes on farms and in marketplaces. In the early centuries of the Christian movement, as in many countries today, Christians often gathered in small daughter churches that belonged to a big mother church. The Christians were now, in their second and third generations, and had been multiplying churches in many regions of the Roman Empire. However, there were now Jewish missionaries who were teaching that Jesus was not a real Messiah, or Christ, as well as Gentile missionaries who were teaching that Jesus was only human and that Christ was a kind of spirit that came down onto Jesus for the time of his ministry. A few comments from various scholars might prove helpful. Although John does not name himself in this epistle, calling himself the Elder, 
everyone who received the letter knew who he was. This was John the Apostle who had been an eye and ear witness to Jesus and to his teaching and was now an overseer of churches at Ephesus in Asia Minor. Now, the term elder was well known in New Testament times. It was used in the Greek Bible to refer to Israelite community leaders. But in wider Greek usage, it could refer to any aged gentleman, commonly used of officials in Jewish synagogues, as well as for magistrates, a kind of judge, in the wider Hellenistic Greek world. This was the preferred term for leaders in early Christian churches, and eventually John would use the term for certain divine beings in heaven described in the book of Revelation. So John begins, The elder to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all those who know the truth. Perhaps because of the sensitive nature of communication between churches, John addressed this epistle to an elect lady and her children. We do not mean that this was a lady named elect, but was rather a distant congregation with its house churches and their members. So by elect we mean Christian churches that have been chosen by God to conduct his business on earth just as Israel had formerly been chosen, because of the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever. For those who were familiar with John's gospel, they knew that the truth was a title of Jesus Christ who called himself the truth. He also promised to send to his followers the indwelling Holy Spirit of truth. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son in truth and love. In the first century of the Christian era, both Jewish and Gentile believers understood that the one true God exists as the invisible Father in heaven and as the visible Son on earth. God is also the invisible Holy Spirit who dwells in and amongst Christians. Whereas other epistles would often start with, May the grace and peace of God be with you, John here rather says, Not a prayer, may be, but gives a firm promise, will be, to reassure Christians in a distant city and town that they are and remain true churches of Jesus Christ. Some of your Bible translations read, The Lord Jesus Christ, because some ancient manuscripts of Second John in Greek do read Lord Jesus Christ. This short expression, God the Father, and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son, reminds us of two very important Christian doctrines. First, the Father and the Son. For we believe that the one true God exists as the invisible Father in heaven, and as the visible Son on earth. God is also the invisible Holy Spirit who dwells in and amongst Christians. There's a spelling fault there. All right, that fixes it. If you would like to have this program that displays parallel texts, you may download it free from the website. A second important doctrine is that of Messiah, or Christ. The ancient Hebrew scriptures teach that someone would come into the world, a great final prophet, priest, and king, whom believers called Messiah in Hebrew and Christ in Greek. Christians believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. John continues, I rejoice it greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth just as we were commanded by the Father. When John says, I rejoice it greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, he was not implying that he had found others from the church who were not walking in the truth. Rather, he was saying that all those church members whom he had met were walking in the truth. Verse 5, 
Now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. To walk or live in the truth means, of course, to conduct ourselves in ways that honor Jesus the Messiah by obeying his commandments. What we have before us here is a letter written in the first century by an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ addressed to the churches with instructions in how to obey Jesus. For these apostolic writings have come to be called in Christian a doctrine Holy Scripture, since John was one of the twelve whom Jesus had appointed apostles, promising to them the Holy Spirit, who would remind them of all that Jesus had taught them. Thus, for Christians, John's letters have become Scripture that we believe and we obey. Jesus himself had said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Thus, to love God is to obey his commandments and our neighbor as ourself. Thus, there is a kind of divine logic in this. First, we believe Jesus' teaching. And Jesus taught us to love God. Then, he explained that to obey his commandments is to love him, and his commandment is to love one another. From the beginning, False teachers were infiltrating Christian churches at this time in history, denying that Jesus be the Messiah come in human flesh, and then leading folk out of their churches. In verse 6, there's an important point of grammar. When John says to walk in it, it in Greek is a grammatical feminine relating back to a feminine noun. Now, there are three such feminine nouns in the preceding text. The word truth, which is 46 words before. The noun love, which came 16 words earlier. And then the word commandment, which is the nearest and most likely antecedent. So John is saying, walk by that commandment. Verse 7, for many deceivers have gone out into the world those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. John is now explaining his reasons for which he reminds Christians to keep showing love one for another, namely that there are many deceivers. These included some Jews and their converts who were denying that Jesus be the Messiah, the Christ. And there were also some Gentiles and their students who were teaching that the Christ was a kind of spirit that dwelt with Jesus for a while. Christians confess that Jesus is the Messiah who came in human flesh, which refers to his incarnation and birth. When we translate Jesus as Christ, the double accusative object of the verb confess makes Jesus the object complement of the verb confess, and Christ the predicate complement, as in 1 John 4, 2. Verse 8, Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. The translation, Coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh, makes for smooth reading. However, in the original language, the word order is Jesus Christ coming in flesh. Literally, we confess Jesus to be Christ coming in the flesh. This refers to Jesus' incarnation and birth. Now, the present participle, coming, can relate either to the past that is, to Jesus' incarnation leading to his birth, let's correct the spelling, or to the future, that is, Jesus' awaited bodily return, possibly, probably, to both, that is, Jesus was, remains, and will return as the Christ in human flesh. 
when John states that such persons are the deceiver and the Antichrist, he is comparing false teachers to the devil who deceives humans and opposes Jesus. Verse 8, Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. That is, those traveling deceivers were seeking to dissuade Christians from their faith and to turn them away from Christian churches. In order to receive a full reward for our future work, church leaders must keep teaching Christians the truth about Jesus Christ, warning them about deceivers, lest those leaders and Christians lose their future rewards. For God will reward faith in the real Jesus Christ, will reward your pastoral work, will reward the showing of love to fellow Christians, and will reward your evangelistic work. Verse 9. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God, whereas whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. The expression goes on is literally to lead the way, that is, by leading others into error, inventing a different Christology. This phrase, who goes on ahead and does not abide, consists of two participles, leading and abiding. These are preceded mm -hmm. by a singular article, the word the, and are joined by the conjunction and, which implies that this is the same person or persons who are both leading and abiding. When John speaks about the teaching of Christ, this could mean Christian teaching about Christ, what we call an objective genitive, or Christ's teaching about himself that we call a subjective genitive. We choose the latter, for it has more authority in the churches than does human opinions or teachings about him. Verse 10, If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. The word if plus the indicative form of the verb comprises what we call in Greek grammar a first-class condition, which assumes the reality of the situation for the sake of argument. Now, since the lady and her sister were churches, their house likely refers to any place where Christians gathered, which was typically in various homes of believers. For in the early centuries, very few churches built chapels. Verse 11, Whoever greets him takes part in his wicked deeds. It is both a sad and a dangerous situation to be involved with cooperating with false teachers who come into our churches. Their evil deeds include deceit, for they are parading as Christian teachers whilst denying the truth about him. Secondly, is their false teaching about Jesus, and lastly, their failure to love Christians. And as John has said elsewhere, if we do not love the brothers, then we do not have eternal life in us. From this overview of Second John, it is possible to suggest a kind of outline or a structure for the book. Dr. Harris observes that Second John is written in a standard epistolary format characteristic of first-century letters. We suggest that the letter consists of four sections. First, a greeting, verses 1 through 3 where John makes it clear that he loves Christians in distant churches because God's truth dwells in them. Part 2, verses 4 through 6, is his message. We Christians love one another because we love God and obey his commandments. Section 3 consists of warnings in verses 7 through 11. Deceivers reject Jesus' teaching and deny that he was the Messiah. So, we must protect our work and our rewards from 
such teachers. And then lastly, at the closing in verses 12 and 13, where John hopes to come speak with the Christians so that their joy may be full. So as you prepare to come meet together for our discussion time, I suggest you read through a Second John three times in different versions. If you don't have different versions, you can find several at BibleHub.com and read them online. As you read, jot down notes and queries that you want to discuss in the Bible study group. Time permitting, in our discussion, we will try to answer together questions such as these. What virtues describe true Christians? What dangers does John describe? What similar dangers exist today? And what must we Christians do about those dangers? And for those of you who are involved in teaching or pastoral work, we suggest that you instruct church leaders and teachers in the truth about Jesus Christ, along with his commandment to love one another. As you coach small group and house church leaders to explain the truth about Jesus Christ to seekers and to Christians, warning them about deceivers who want to teach them. So, Learn from those leaders what Christians actually believe and say about Jesus. Then agree on a plan to teach the truth about Jesus, correcting their errors. Thanks for your patience. I hope you will see me here again in about two weeks with comments and introduction to John's third epistle. <music>